Cardiac output is one of the most important concepts in cardiology. The reason why is because cardiac output contributes to blood pressure. And we know that blood pressure is one of the biggest killers. I'm Dr. Mark Todorovic and in this video we're taking a look at cardiac output and all the factors that can contribute to cardiac output. Let's first begin with a definition. What is cardiac output? Simply, it is the volume of blood, the volume of blood ejected from the heart per minute. The volume of blood ejected from the heart every minute. And you can see that there's two factors here. These two factors are the volume of blood that's ejected and how many ejections per minute. They're the two factors. So the volume of blood ejected in a single contraction and how many contractions do we have every minute? Which means we can take this cardiac output and we can expand it to include those two factors because cardiac output is a very simple equation. Cardiac output equals the volume of blood ejected every contraction, which we actually call the stroke volume. Stroke volume, let's write that down. Stroke volume, and again that the stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected every time the heart contracts. Think about it like this. What we've got here is the left atrium, the left ventricle, and then that left ventricle leads out to the aorta, right? So think about it like this. At, when your heart's at rest, remember, it contracts, relaxes, contracts, relaxes, contracts, relaxes. When it relaxes, this is the time that the heart fills with blood. Now this relaxation we call diastole. So let's write this down. Diastole. The heart is relaxing. And like I said, when it relaxes, you've got venous return, bringing blood back, and it's going to fill the heart. Now right at the very end of relaxation, you're going to have a particular volume of blood in the heart. We call that the end diastolic volume. That makes total sense, right? The E DV. The end diastolic volume is the amount of blood that will maximally fill the heart at the end of relaxation. And on average, that volume is around about 130 milliliters. Now, what happens at the very end of relaxation? We have contraction. So the muscles of the heart, they're going to contract. And as they contract, they push the blood out via the arteries. In this case, because it's the left ventricle, via the aorta. So we know that contraction is actually termed systole. So systole means contraction. Think about this. At the very end of contraction, you will have ejected as much blood as you possibly can out of that ventricle. Now, the thing is this, not all the blood exits the heart. Some of the blood will remain which means at the very end of systole, you're gonna have a particular volume of blood remaining here in the heart. We call this the end systolic volume. The end systolic volume. And the amount of blood that's left at the end of systole is around about 60 mils, 60 milliliters. Now look what we've just done. We've highlighted the, the amount of blood that will maximally fill the heart during relaxation, and how much blood is left over at the end of contraction. And if I take 130 minus 60, so if I take the EDV, the EDV, and minus the ESV, the ESV, I should get the stroke volume, the amount of blood that was ejected. So what we can do is it's going to be 130 mils, Minus 60, what's that? What does that give us? That gives us 70 milliliters. That means the amount of blood that gets ejected from the heart every contraction, called the stroke volume, is around about 70 milliliters. And this changes due to people, depending on the person, but on average it's 70 milliliters. Now here's the thing. There's a couple of factors that can affect this, which we're gonna talk about in a sec. But before we do, we need to talk about the next point here. We just spoke about the volume of blood ejected every beat, but what about the amount of beats the heart performs per minute? 
Well, this one's easy. This is called the heart rate. The heart rate is the amount of beats that the heart performs per minute. So if you take stroke volume and multiply it by heart rate, you actually get the cardiac output. So we've got our heart rate here. Heart rate is how many times does the heart beat per minute? Simple. Now, what's the answer to that? On average, and again, it depends on each person, it's around about 70 beats per minute. Now, we've got our equation. 70 mils times 70 beats per minute should give us the total volume of blood ejected every minute, called our cardiac output. 70 times 70 is 4. 0.9 liters. So our cardiac output on average is 4.9 liters. But this can change. We can change cardiac output by changing each of these. Look, it's an equation. If I were to increase stroke volume, I'm going to increase cardiac output. If I increase heart rate, I'm going to increase cardiac output. Decrease stroke volume, decrease cardiac output, decrease heart rate, decrease cardiac output, right? So what things contribute to stroke volume changing. Well, think about what we said. We said three important things. Venous return, filling the heart. Contraction of the heart. And ejection of the blood out of the heart. You can alter any of these three things, which will alter stroke volume, which will alter cardiac output. Let's take a look at these. So I'm going to get rid of this and this, just so we've got some room, and let's have a look. The first factor that contributes to stroke volume is that venous return. Venous return. Remember, venous return is the amount of blood returning back to the heart via the veins. Veins always go back towards the heart. How can we alter this? Well, think about it. Exercise. If I'm running or contracting my muscles, those muscles contract around the veins and they squeeze the veins and they promote blood return to the heart. So exercise increases venous return, increasing stroke volume, increasing cardiac output. Awesome. But remember, this venous return is going to directly correlate with the amount of blood filling the heart. The amount of blood filling the heart. Now I want you to think about this. When we look at the amount of blood filling the heart, once it's maximally filled, right, we call this preload. Now, preload is the stretch that the blood places on the walls of our ventricles when it's maximally filled, so at the end diastolic volume. I'll say that again. Blood returns back to the heart. The heart fills with blood and stretches it. At the very end of this filling, the degree of stretch on the walls of our ventricles is called preload. And why is this important for you to know? Because preload is directly related to the amount of blood that gets ejected due to something called the Frank-Starling mechanism. The Frank-Starling mechanism. Now, what is the Frank Starling mechanism? It's very simple. The more you stretch the heart, the greater the reflexive contraction of the heart will be, which means the more blood that gets ejected. Beautiful. So preload is directly related to stroke volume. And preload is directly related to venous return. So the more you stretch the heart, the greater the contraction. Now, all of this is part of venous return, right? Preload. The next factor we need to talk about is the contraction of the heart. What do you need to know about contraction? What do you know about contraction? How can a muscle contract? What does a muscle need to contract? Well, it needs calcium. So contraction is really dependent on calcium. And you can have factors that promote calcium or inhibit calcium, and we call these inotropic agents. Inotropic agents. And these inotropic agents, they can be positive or negative. So positive inotropic agents are going to promote calcium or increase the availability of calcium. Negative inotropic agents are going to decrease calcium or decrease the availability of calcium. So what 
plays a role here? Well, let's have a look. Calcium antagonists, right? They can play a role. So think about noradrenaline. Noradrenaline. Thyroid hormone. They're two important factors that can play a role. What can decrease calcium? Well, think about calcium blockers. Any drug that's a calcium blocker. Or electrolyte imbalances. If your electrolytes are off and your calcium levels are low, well, it's going to decrease the availability of calcium and decrease the contractile force. So again, anything that increases the contractile force of calcium increases contraction, increasing the ejection of the blood from the heart. That's the second point. The third point, third and final point for uh, stroke volume is the blood actually leaving the heart itself. Now, this is a term called afterload, which many students have difficulties with. Simple. When the blood gets ejected from the heart, it's going to face some degree of resistance because it's moving through a pipe. If that's a wider pipe, there's less resistance, more blood can leave. If it's a narrow pipe, greater resistance, less blood will leave. That is afterload. Afterload is the resistance that the blood experiences as it leaves the ventricle. Think about this. Some people may have atherosclerosis. They develop plaques in the walls of their arteries which narrows the diameter of that artery. What does that do? That increases afterload, which means it increases the resistive force that the blood is experiencing as it's leaving the heart. If that's the case, less blood gets ejected, stroke volume goes down. So afterload is inversely correlated with stroke volume. You increase afterload, meaning you increase the resistance the blood experiences, the stroke volume goes down. Decrease afterload, stroke volume goes up. Beautiful. These are the three factors that contribute to stroke volume. Venous return, contraction due to calcium, and afterload. Let's quickly take a look at heart rate. This is an easy one. What can affect how fast the heart contracts? Well, this is where we look at the autonomic nervous system. So remember the autonomic nervous system, that automatic nervous system, is the fight or flight response and rest and digest. So what are they called? the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. If the sympathetic nervous system innervates the heart, it can innervate the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node and it increases the contraction, the rate of contraction of that muscle tissue. So sympathetic nervous system innervating or speaking to the heart will increase heart rate. The parasympathetic nervous system, which is going to be the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve, which is the 10th cranial nerve, when that innervates and speaks of the heart, it tells it to slow down and decreases heart rate. We call these chronotropic effects. Chronotropic. So we had inotropic before about the force of contraction, chronotropic, chrono means time. So it's about the timing of contraction. Sympathetic nervous system increases the heart rate, parasympathetic nervous system decreases. And so what we've run through today is cardiac output and all the various factors that can influence it. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.